Hello. Welcome to the mother-baby relationship, how experiences shape our genes and our health. I'm Dr. Bob Murray, president of the American Academy of Pediatrics Ohio chapter, and representing Good for Growth, a funded project of the Cardinal Health Foundation. Today we will look at three topics related to the mother-child relationship. One, the discovery of the fact that chronic diseases of adulthood, such as heart disease and diabetes, are programmed during pregnancy. Two, our realization that the programming of adult diseases in the uterine environment is just the first step in a lifelong process. This discovery has led to the realization that our experiences directly affect how our genes and our body work. A whole new field of science has developed from these findings called epigenetics. And three, what we have learned about the things that a pregnant mother can do to ensure that the in utero environment is a positive, nurturing one for their developing baby. The Cardinal Health Foundation and the Ohio chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics developed Good for Growth to highlight the critical importance of relationships in shaping the foundation for a child's future health, mental health, cognitive development, and social skills. At the heart of the adult-child relationship is the concept of serve and return, in which the adult reinforces the child's exploration of their environment and builds on it. This back-and-forth sharing of experiences between adult and a child, particularly between mother and child, is the process through which a child builds their knowledge and skills. The first 1,000 days are unique. The newborn, using all five senses, their muscles and their brain, begin a period of explosive and unparalleled growth. What is remarkable is the extent to which this happens even in the uterine environment. I confess that my concept of pregnancy for most of my career as a pediatrician was this. The fetus is cocooned within the uterus, well protected, drawing whatever it needs from mom and growing along the lines laid down by its genetic code. But I was wrong. Things are far less determined by our genes during development than by our environment and experiences. In this sense, parenting truly begins at conception, not at birth. By her lifestyle, her diet, activity, habits, stresses, and behaviors, the pregnant woman creates the uterine environment. It's this environment that will mold and shape the way the child grows and develops in preparation for the outside world. How did researchers uncover the crucial importance of the mother-child relationship during pregnancy? The story is fascinating. In one of the landmark studies of the past century, Dr. Clement Smith from Harvard and other researchers examined the consequences of famine on pregnancy. Before Holland was liberated from German occupation and food supplies were reestablished, an intense shortage occurred among the Dutch. For six months, energy intakes were only 400 to 1,000 kilocalories per day, exposing the pregnant female and her fetus to malnutrition. Normal calories should be over 2,500 calories per day. Dr. Smith studied the extent of the famine among women pregnant before, during, and after the famine, carefully tracking their medical course, as well as that of their offspring. The initial conclusion of the study was that babies born to malnourished mothers had lower birth weights, as you might expect. But a surprise finding of Dr. Smith also was that over time, neurologic damage and poor mental performance were found in children born during the famine, along with a tendency toward obesity. These findings were a mystery for over 50 years until more studies uncovered the reasons. When researchers looked back at the children of the Dutch famine, who were now in their 50s, many additional health problems were noted. Medical conditions as diverse as impaired kidney function, lung function, cardiovascular disease, and breast cancer were seen, along with the obesity that Clement Smith had noted previously. What the scientists found was that there are critical periods during development of our cells, tissues, and organs, as well as their connections, when nutritional deficiencies occur during these critical periods, not only are there immediate consequences for the pregnancy, but also there are permanent changes in the baby's body, their physiology, and their metabolism. The striking finding was that these changes were not obvious early in life, 
but instead became apparent only when the body was stressed with aging. How is that possible? Many studies followed. Collectively, they showed that not only famine, too few calories over time, but also obesity, too many calories, and even malnutrition, nutrient imbalances in the maternal diet during pregnancy could program the way in which the fetus developed within the uterus. And the changes could affect all the systems of the body depending on the timing and the extent of the insult. What that meant was, even though we all get one set of genes from mother and father, the way those genes function can be changed by our experiences within the uterus. Poor nutrition, it turned out, is a powerful force in shaping fetal growth and development and in establishing future health risks. Let me show you one example. A researcher named Brenner, a kidney specialist, was curious about how renal hypertension came about in adults. When he read about the findings of the fetal researchers, he did this experiment. He fed pregnant rat mothers a diet that had normal calories, so it was not a case of famine or obesity, but instead was inadequate only in the amount and quality of the protein during the pregnancy. Without those critical proteins, the fetal kidney could not grow to its full size. Brenner found that lack of protein during the critical time of kidney development resulted in a stunted kidney with fewer kidney cells. As a result, each kidney cell had to filter harder to clear the chemicals out of the blood. Well, over time, the cells began to become exhausted. They began to filter poorly and then die off. Sodium began to build up in the blood due to poor filtration, and as a result, hypertension occurred and the kidney started to fail. For the fetus, the lack of protein forced a different type of development than that which was signaled by the DNA. Nutrition had altered kidney development and then, therefore, adult disease. An inadequate intake of calories or protein cannot support optimal growth and development of the embryo and fetus. But studies over the past few decades have shown that many different insults during pregnancy can play a similar role in altering fetal development and health. For example, decreased placental blood flow has the same effect as cutting available nutrients. It creates a famine for the baby. Other insults may poison cells or whole body systems, limit developing tissue growth, or alter communication between tissues of the body, often permanently. The sudden rise of obesity and gestational diabetes in this century have put the mother, the pregnancy, and the fetus at greater risk. Now, after more than 25 years of research studies, we know that there are many different types of insults or stresses that can occur during pregnancy and they can cause many different chronic diseases in adulthood, including some of the most common, severe, and costly diseases in America, ones with the highest mortality rates. The findings that our adult health is directly affected by insults occurring within the uterus is startling. It means that we need to take better care of the fetus by helping mothers take better care of themselves. During the critical nine months of pregnancy, when the body and the brain are developing, the uterine environment lays the foundation for the rest of the baby's life. The extent to which experiences and environments change development has been one of the great findings in medicine over the past quarter century. The new field of epigenetics has set out to study the mechanisms that are at work in our cells. What they have found is that our genes don't change in response to insults or stresses. Instead, the many different proteins that the genes make to signal our cells do change. They're turned on or off in response to our environment. This means that our experiences are able to change which proteins are made, when they're made, and how much are made. In that way, our experiences control gene expression. Think about it like this. We only have around 20,000 genes controlling all the complex information that regulates each of the billions of cells in our body. The water flea has 31,000 genes, a third more than we humans. 
Geneticists long ago debunked the idea that more complex organisms require more genes. In fact, the greatest number of genes in nature can be found in the Paris japonica, a rare flowering plant native to Japan. Instead, it's more like chess. You have a board with a limited number of squares, a limited number of pieces, and a restricted set of movements for each piece. This should be a simple game. Instead, there are nearly infinite possibilities depending on which pieces are played when and how the other pieces respond during the game. In the same way, our limited 20,000 genes are capable of directing a complex body within a complex social environment precisely because of the way they turn on or turn off the production of gene proteins in response to our experiences. So our environment starts shaping our lives immediately from conception. One set of genes, many possibilities. The outcomes can change our health, mental health, cognition, and social interactions throughout our life. Pretty high stakes. This has been one of the great findings in medical science in this past century. So what does it mean then to be a mother? Given how helpless the baby is and for how long, parenting is a life or death dependency for the infant. It's more than just survival and comfort. What epigenetics has shown us is that many, many features of the baby's life are on the line before and after birth. Thankfully, nature gives us a helping hand to make sure that we take that job seriously. Being a pregnant woman is different from being a non-pregnant woman. A pregnant woman needs to become highly sensitive and emotionally attuned to the child's needs and cues. A mother has to be motivated, empathetic to the demanding newborn, rewarded by their interaction, and restrained in her physical and emotional impulses. In short, she has to fall in love. In fact, it's fascinating, but MRI brain scans of mothers and of people in love show very close similarities. Of course, fathers change and fall in love with the baby as well, but being a mother is different. As soon as the baby is conceived, the woman begins to mentally and emotionally transform into a mother. Pregnancy is as much an epigenetic force for the mother as it is for the developing fetus. Conception turns on a cascade of hormones that flood the body, priming not just the uterus for a fertilized egg, but also preparing the mother physically and mentally. One of the recent findings from sophisticated MRI scans on the brains of pregnant female is that it's not just a chemical type of change, but a genuine structural change in the brain. Those regions responsible for emotion, mood, anxiety, impulse control, attention, and planning are all dramatically different during and after pregnancy. These extraordinary changes reach a climax during the first three months of the baby's life. In other Good for Growth discussions, we have spoken about how maternal nurturing determined a baby's future response to stress. In a fascinating series of experiments, one Canadian research team showed that when baby rats were put under stress every day due to being weighed and measured, some mothers would lick and nurture their pups back to calmness, while other mothers did little or nothing to soothe their baby. As they aged, the rat pups who were nurtured after stress grew to be normal, well-adjusted, healthy, and socially adapted. The highly stressed pups that were not mothered after being stressed became anxious, irritable, antisocial, fearful, and sick. But that was just part of the story. What happened to those deprived pups when they became mothers? It turned out that the deprived pups became poorly nurturing mothers, just like their mothers had been. Their brain pathways had become permanently changed. They were less responsive to the flood of mothering hormones that came with pregnancy. Their mothers transferred their mothering style to them, one generation to the next. This astonishing finding taught us that epigenetic changes could be passed down generationally. The same is true of certain chronic diseases and some mental health problems. So the stakes are very, very high for the developing baby. Epigenetics raises a serious challenge for us. How can we ensure that every baby grows in the safest, healthiest environment throughout pregnancy, from conception to birth? Even before the pregnancy test results are known, the fetus has already undergone substantial development. 
Look at how many major organ systems are underway during this critical time. Any significant insult or stress could be devastating. In fact, at least 25% of pregnancies are miscarried in the first trimester alone, suggesting that in many cases, the maternal environment isn't ideal for supporting the embryo. Insults may come in many different forms, from a toxic injury such as alcohol or tobacco to a nutrient deficiency such as folic acid or poor weight management. The fetus adapts to the environment in which it grows. And epigenetic effects occur quickly. Changes in gene expression in response to social and physical events are immediate. Here's a fun example from the world of fish. The typical African chiclet is blue and small, as on the right, but the kingfish in the school, on the left, is bigger and more colorful. In an experiment, researchers took the kingfish out of the tank one night. Once the number two fish realized that number one was gone, it took only 12 hours for it to bulk up and become a dapper, colorful kingpin of his own. Epigenetic changes on the gene expression can affect not only physical appearances, but also behavior due to endocrine fluctuations and brain function. The takeaway is that the health and behavior of a young woman begins exerting its effect on the fetus immediately. Parenthood begins at conception. And even armed with the best of intentions to fix bad habits once they become pregnant, the opportunity is often missed. Unintended pregnancies make up over 50% of all births, mostly because of inappropriate use of contraceptives. Optimal pregnancy outcomes for mother and baby depend on a healthy, fit, and nutritionally strong woman entering the first trimester. Done well, preventive health care for all women in childbearing years, including young teens, could be one of our best weapons to ensure the health of both the mother and the baby. Here are the basics for the pregnancy diet. Regular small meals and snacks throughout the day will limit cravings and therefore calories. Carrying simple snacks of nuts, seeds, dried fruit, yogurt, or balanced energy bars, along with water, will help minimize consumption of processed foods and sweet drinks. If cravings are too much to bear, then try eating only a small amount of chips or ice cream to satisfy the urge and then switch to other, more nutritious foods. Remember that the rapid expansion of blood volume and blood cells to serve the needs of the baby require additional fluid. Drink 10 cups per day, making water and fluid milk the primary fluids. The old adage that the pregnant woman is eating for two is not a license to eat mindlessly. Granted, during pregnancy, a woman may experience food cravings and hunger, especially if her diet pattern is not ideal. But the caloric demands of carrying a growing fetus are not really significant until the second and third trimester. Even at the end of the first trimester, at week 12, the baby measures only two inches and weighs only a half an ounce. That pinky size hardly justifies wolfing down more snacks and desserts every day. But in the latter two trimesters, the growing fetus warrants additional high-quality daily calories for mom. This is critical to lay the foundation for lifelong health and to prepare the mother for a time of heightened physical stress. In the third trimester between 28 and 40 weeks, when the fetus has experienced a significant expansion in size, an additional 300 to 500 calories of high-quality nutrients plays a crucial role in supporting the mother and the child. All pregnant women need a balanced diet, high in nutrients. But the number of calories needed to ensure the best outcome for the pregnancy differs between women depending on their pre-pregnancy body mass index, or BMI. That weight determines the target weight gain and thus the daily calories needed to support the pregnancy. Weight below recommendations can result in preterm birth. Here in Ohio, 10% of all white and 14% of all black babies are born premature. In addition, maternal weight gain below recommendations risks low birth weight and small for gestational age babies, as well as a failure to initiate breastfeeding successfully. Weight above recommendations risks excess size and weight babies, resulting in high C-section deliveries. 
C-sections in the U.S. accounted for one-third of all births in 2014. Postpartum weight retention long-term can put mom's future health at risk as well. So a woman's BMI at birth determines how much weight her obstetrician will recommend that she gain, ranging from as much as 40 pounds for underweight women to as little as 15 pounds in overweight women. Some extremely obese women may even be counseled not to gain any weight at all. Advice from an experienced registered dietitian nutritionist may be important for many as they struggle to stay within weight gain guidelines. Where does all that weight go, anyway? Well, the baby only makes up around 7 to 8 pounds, usually. The rest goes to mom's tissues that will make up the environment in which the baby thrives. All of these changes are critical building blocks for a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby. Do not diet during pregnancy. So, a message for all young women in childbearing years from 14 to 40. Take care of yourself all the time, but especially during and after pregnancy. The environment that you make after conception is important for your health, for the baby's health, and for the pregnancy outcomes. It's not just diet. Daily activities such as simple brisk walking will help with weight management, fitness, and controlling stress. Sleep and stress management are critical during pregnancy. Treat depression seriously, and to prevent it, enlist a network of support. So here's the most important message. The mother and the fetus, and later the baby, reflect their experiences within every cell of their body. Epigenetics has taught us that our experiences change gene expression and therefore change the body's and the brain's function. These changes determine how we behave so that with time we act and think based on our prior experiences. This first, very close mother-child relationship builds a foundation for our health, mental health, cognitive, and social behavior for the rest of our life. Thank you for listening to this webinar on the mother-baby relationship. Good for Growth emphasizes the relationship between parents and their children throughout childhood. If you have an interest in other areas of child development and parental relationships, please see our website at goodforgrowth.com.